so thank you don i'm just now recording so thank you don thank you to everyone else who's joining us today i i'm aware that those that have just started recording so you're hearing a different accent to normal as and don is with us and um, so as you'll see this is part 26 this is quite a long series of events that are taking place and um, and through our events so far we've been very much looking at experiences within libraries of how they've coped with the lo how lockdowns, how they've coped with restrictions, how they've worked to continue offering services. We've had some fantastic inputs from technologists, people who are working to use libraries as nodes and networks. How can we actually make sure that people are not just accessing the internet within libraries, but also outside in parking lots and car parks, but also much broad, more widely out into communities. We've heard from architects, we've heard from broader library thinkers. So, a really wide perspective on how libraries are, can respond. What we're looking to do today is a little bit different. And, and what, uh, we're going to look now at actually, what can we do? What can we ask politicians, decision makers, funders to do in order to help libraries deliver? Now, as I said, we've seen so much resilience, so much inventiveness, so much innovation, but clearly libraries are public services. They rely on support to be able to do this. And so hopefully what we can come out with from today is a clear idea of well, what can those asks be? What can that partnership look like? So when does daylight savings time start? Monday. Okay. And <laughs> um, I need to make sure I'm muting more people here. Um, so as I said, this series is produced by Gigabit Libraries Network by Don Mew, by Don Means. Um, we at IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, have been very happy to host it, to bring this opportunity to as many people as possible. Um, all of the recordings are available on the Gigabit Libraries Net website. They're also available on YouTube, and we'll share a link subsequently. Um, now, overall, this is the case. This is what we're looking for. Now, the Partnership for Public Access is a group of like-minded organizations, organizations that believe that we need something new, we need a different approach if we're going to get those people who remain offline online. Clearly we've seen growth over the years, but the pandemic, the COVID-19 COVID has made it very clear that we can't really afford to wait. We need to act more, we need to act now, we need to take sort of quantitative, uh, quantitative, qualitative steps forward. Therefore, um, as set out here, we have 3 billion people around the world who continue to lack access, 100 million even in the US who don't have adequate access to make full use of the internet. We need to move away from this gradual approach and we need to think about what does an effective package of measures to bring more people online look at. And this is what the Partnership for Public Access does. And our groups, the groups involved in it, are promoting to public access through institutions such as libraries and other, co other community anchor institutions. Similarly, community networks, ways for communities themselves to get together in order to promote effective access to the internet and also offline internet, recognizing that not only is it going to take more time for some communities to get online, but of course no internet connection is 100% sure and that we need to have a fallback if ever the wires, the masts, the fiber optics go down. So as I said, this is, I've got the three parts up here. And the idea is that how can we then take these different elements? How can we incorporate them effectively into strategies? How can we actually make them, a, how can we make sure that all parts of government are working together, recognizing these potential, this potential and actually providing a comprehensive solution? So today we have a variety of speakers who have been involved in the Partnership for Public Access. And in particular, our call to action that we released at the time of the World Bank, uh, the World Bank um, uh, session on digital inclusion a couple of weeks ago. And we will include, if you go to the website, p4pa.net, you will find this call for action. We will post a link up into the chat. Um, but then each of the speakers is going to give a little bit of an insight into why the call to action matters for them why this is important, what they're doing, and what they hope that can be what they hope can be done in the future. So I'm going to start um, with myself. And so you're going to get rid of my interventions as soon as possible, which I think is probably a good thing. Um, so in terms of why IFLA as an organization, the International Federation of Library Associations, is interested in this, um, 
For us, libraries play an essential role in their communities, helping people to realize their potential through meaningful access to information without discrimination. And for us, it's really important to talk about this meaningful access. Yes. Because for us, connectivity is not just about connectivity, is not just about having a device or having a physical connection. It's also about having the skills and the confidence in order to be able to make use of it and access to content, which is both, which is relevant in the right language in order to be able to actually gain from that having access to the internet. Therefore, when the risk is then for libraries is that when libraries are not connected to the internet and cannot offer these services, but also when people in communities don't have access, the impact that libraries can have, the positive impact that they can have is considerably less. Now, of course, particularly at times of COVID-19, this is even more so because libraries in so many places have been forced to close their doors. And even just in the last days, we've seen in France, in Ireland, libraries once again having to close their doors, once again having to move from a hybrid to a purely online offer or pick and collect in order to be able to offer access. Just like our members, however, we shouldn't just think in terms of... Read your mind. Sorry, I'm just going to mute uh, Sean here because we're getting quite a lot of background there. Um, there we go. Um, just like our members, we can't and we shouldn't think purely in terms of what's good for libraries. We need to think of what's good for communities. Now, I think for them, and I think just flipping that perspective, for people in our communities, libraries are part of that broader internet infrastructure, that we are part of the connectivity service, the connectivity infrastructure that governments, that others should, be for, should, should we would argue, be obliged to provide in order to help everyone get online. We'd argue that therefore libraries, these community, community anchor institutions can be just as important for connectivity as masts, as cables, as internet exchange points and beyond. And that's why we're so focused on ensuring that when policies are developed for these infrastructures, libraries are at the table, that they're part of it. Therefore, as part of IFLA's wider remit, both to advocate for libraries and to support excellent service provision, we're working both to help library associations engage with development of strategies and to ensure that libraries themselves are motivated, are ready to actually provide that access in the most effective way possible. For example, we've put out our own uh, public access policy toolkit in order to help our members, uh, policy toolkit in order to help our members engage in these discussions. Similarly, we have guidelines which set out answers to some of the questions that library directors may have. How do you deal with difficult content? How do you think about providing skills? How do you deal with situations where you don't have enough equipment to be able to offer people all the access that they would like? Now, in parallel with this, this is why we've been so keen to sign on to this call for action, to work with some really great organizations from around the world, some really committed expert people in order to make this call on governments that now, especially now, when the digital divide is really it's more at risk than ever of becoming a development divide, where the digital divide means that people are being deprived of health care, of education, of employment. We need to make this real extra step to make sure that every library is online, but also that there is the content available online, offline for schools, that we need to make sure that libraries have the skills, the confidence to be able to support their communities, and that really we can take advantage of libraries as these labs these places where we can bring together services, turn simple connectivity into real change. And that's why we've been so happy to sign on to the call for action. In parallel, we've produced our own pledge, um, the Ple Library Pledge for Digital Inclusion. I'm glad to say we're already at over 200 signatories, including some of the world's biggest library associations, underlining their commitment to doing all they can with the resources they have to bring more people online. We therefore hope, and we'll hear from many more people during this conversation, um, <clears throat> but we hope that as the world thinks about, well, what are the changes needed in the light of COVID-19? What can we do now? Making sure that we are connecting the neighboring libraries in order to connect to neighbor populations is so vital. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Jane Coffin from the Internet Society as the second speaker on our list. Jane, are you able to go live? I am. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much, um, Stephen. And thank you to Don, Stephen, and the others who have been driving um, this work. 
we're a strong supporter, as I think many of you may know, um, that the internet is for everyone. <laughs> Open, globally connected, secure, and trustworthy. Um, what that also means, um, supporting partners around the world who are driving connectivity options, whether um, complementary options, uh, alternative options. This was, of course, uh, during normal times, but with COVID, it's become even more amplified um, with respect to, as Stephen is saying, people having to shut their doors, um, institutions like libraries, which have been so critical for learning, education, safety for kids after school. Um, it's something that we're strongly supportive of as making sure that libraries are strong anchor institutions. And so as we go virtual, how can we do that together more and more? And um, as, as someone working with many teams around the world on um, community networks, we've been thrilled to partner up with the library association with IFLA and with Don and with others to partner up because if we don't do this together, we're not going to get more people connected. Um, we have a critical opportunity right now to use, um, to use the, the pandemic in a positive way to support libraries, to support the mission, and to also support getting people connected and for digital skills to be um, better delivered and for people to be trained up through capacity development. So I'm not gonna um, say much more other than we strongly support the efforts here. We're a, a signatory to the statement. And we just want to thank everyone that doing the great work that you're doing. Um, I will say that even though we do focus on some of the infrastructure, we need to focus on our partners like Ifla, um, Maylin and her team, um, Don with the work that the, the group is doing um, and all of you here at GLN to see where we can help out. Um, we do have grants through our foundation. We have funds that we do um, distribute to partners for um, infrastructure development. So anything we can do to help bridge that connectivity gap is something that we're keen to try and address. So thank you very much. And thank you for moving this forward. And, I, and Stephen, it's really exciting to hear that there are more people signed on. Um, I think right now, people need a call to action. <laughs> There's something that people wanna grab onto and feel like they're doing something positive as well because we've seen so many things that may not be. And let's see what we can do to move this forward. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane, and for your words, but also obviously for all your cooperation and support over time. And I know that there are some already so much, there's so much excellent work going on at the global, at the national level in order to partner between ISOC and other partners. And there's so many great ideas we can scale up and hopefully now is really the time. I'm now going to hand over to Teddy, but the fact of handing over to Teddy is going to take place through me sharing a video that he has kindly pre-recorded for us. So now for the video. Hi everyone, I'm Teddy Woodhouse from the Alliance for Affordable Internet. I'm really, really sorry I can't join you today, um, but we're really excited about the work around Every Community Connected, the pledge, and the campaign that we're hoping to build up together um, in alliance with libraries and other like-minded organizations. Um, for us as an organization, we're focused on trying to provide affordable and meaningful access for as many people as possible around the globe. Um, and that really requires a lot of attention and specific policies and regulatory reforms towards ensuring that access is available even for the most vulnerable people and the most remote communities. Public access solutions such as Wi-Fi networks at libraries are vital to this mission and that's why we think that this pledge and its work are so essential. Um, we're really excited to trying to close the digital gender gap as we think this pledge can help us do um, and working together with all of you. So I hope to see you at IGF, the Internet Governance Forum, later this year um, and looking forward to the campaign as well. Have a great meeting. So with thanks to Teddy for that and obviously he's not <clears throat> he's not here to hear he's not here to hear me say this, but Certainly A for AI, uh, Alliance for Affordable Internet does some fantastic work at the national level. And indeed, again, there we're seeing really good examples of them forming those partnerships, bringing in libraries, but many others, in order to find concrete solutions to develop the standards, the practices, the partnerships needed to actually bring the, the internet, bring the internet to more people. So now I'm very happy to hand over to Mei Lin Fung from People Connected Internet. I think certainly the call for action that we're talking about a lot today is very much thanks to her and her insistence on being concise and attractive in what we say and do and using that exactly as Jane said as a 
a way to actually get people to engage, to get them to think about this as a solution. So over to you, Maylin. Thank you, Stephen, and thank everybody for being here. We are facing such a big challenge. Even though half of us are online, we have so many more who aren't. And by coming together, we can do something. We are facing a whole generation that really is losing their chance at learning. And libraries can play an incredible role in connecting communities to the internet to help the children. This has become a major priority for the United Nations. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, is the first Secretary General who's an electrical engineer. And he, more than anybody else who's ever headed these United Nations, has prioritized this for the UN. Libraries can be the role that help the road for people to connect to the internet. We're now all working, living online in ways that connect us across time zones, across national boundaries, and it's invading our personal and domestic boundaries, so we're feeling it as well. People in the libraries have understood the internet. They are experts within each community to help us navigate these new waters, the new frontier we're in. And future generations are counting on us to act. If we want to act, libraries are a place where communities can come together to decide how to address the big challenges we have. I hate when I walk into the kitchen for food and all I find are ingredients. These ingredients are there in the library. Libraries are our community kitchens. Let's go into the libraries and cook. We can be responsible to future generations and use the common building blocks that are in the libraries that you can access so that we can all work together. We can do this. Libraries can connect us. Let's cook. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maylin. That, I, I, that's a fantastic call to action. That's an even more concise call to action than the one we have already. So I, I think, yes, I think that's exactly it. And I think it's one of the arguments that we see a lot and that we certainly try to make is that gone are the days of top-down development, gone are the days of telling people to what they should do. We need rather to be able to enable people to take their own decisions for themselves because that's the only way that we can make them sustainable and ensure that people can take ownership. So now I'm very happy to uh, invite Edouard Delbond to, to speak. Edouard is from Bibliotheques Sans Frontières, Libraries Without Borders, which has a huge amount of, again, really excellent work on the ground in some really, really tough situations in order to make sure that people can benefit from access to information. So over to you, Edouard. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, so I, I'm going to, so at Libraries Without Borders, uh, BSF, Bibliothèque Sans Frontières in French, uh, libraries are in our name, in at the core of our identity. And even though we've, uh, be, we were created in 2007 to uh, uh, improve uh, books, donations uh, around the world uh, in developing countries, we are now uh, implementing very innovative solutions and high-tech solutions in order to provide uh, access to education and information to uh, the ones who are most in need. And uh, right now I'm going to talk to you about one of these solution and one of this initiative uh, that uh, uh, we are participating to. Um, so, as you said, despite the fact of uh, uh, despite the fast growth of uh, global internet connectivity in the past years, 3.6 million people are still dis disconnected from this global uh, information society. And uh, in, tw in 20 years from now, studies show that 20% uh, of uh, Africa's population will still be deprived from the internet. So that's around 400 million people. Um, and as you said, communities excluded from the internet are often uh, the most vulnerable ones, uh, and this exclusion exacerbates uh, wealth, educational, social, health inequalities, 
uh, that they already suffer from. Um, now we've seen that in a global health crisis uh, situation, access to quality information is a matter of life and death. So it's not a, a, a situation that uh, should be overlooked. Um, so we at Library of Our Borders, we advocate for, of course, the connectivity of each and every one to the global information society. Uh, and so we want to push for internet connection everywhere. But we are also pragmatists. And we know that many communities will be left behind uh, from this global internet network because they are geographically isolated or because they simply cannot afford it. Um, that's why in 2018, we co-founded the Offline Internet Consortium, uh, which is now a group of 25 organizations from all around the world, uh, working together to reinvent the internet and to make it available offline. Uh, it's based on an open source technology and yeah, our mission is really to empower people worldwide by promoting free access to knowledge and information in areas deprived from the internet with a great eye, if you may. Um, so what do we do? We set standards for software development, for content indexing and for metadata. Uh, we try to build a repository, a depository of uh, content, uh, useful content and apps. And we created OLIP, uh, which means offline internet platform. It's at the same time a software which can be uh, uh, implemented and downloaded on any device with a Wi-Fi antenna and create a Wi-Fi network. Um, and it's based on the marketplace uh, from which you can download uh, websites offline or you can download apps on, off offline. Um, and this solution, OLIP solution, we now implement it with NGOs all around the world and states and ministries um, to deliver impact in, uh, for education, health, um, and, and, and many other uh, use cases. So just to quickly, uh, to give you two examples, um, with UNICEF and Ministry of Education in Burundi, uh, we deployed offline internet servers in Burundi schools. Um, those servers were uh, uploaded with educational content and uh, resources such as Khan Academy that you probably know with educational videos and exercises that were all tailor-made uh, for the specific context and uh, school programs and the, those servers in offline areas enable people uh, teachers on the one hand to uh, prepare their uh, courses and uh, pupils on the other end to uh, actually access uh, the, the resources. Um, in health, as far as health is concerned, uh, in Central African Republic, uh, we, we implemented uh, OLIP servers with the French Red Cross in the community centers to uh, uh, lead outreach, health outreach programs about uh, sens uh, sensitization around HIV, tropical diseases, chronic diseases, um, and all the resources on these offline uh, servers were used by uh, health professionals to um, train themselves and to uh, uh, inform the population about uh, these issues. So, of course, we support the call, uh, we support the pledge, and we will be very involved in the campaign uh, because we want to call on uh, public authorities to make their best effort uh, so that no one is excluded from the Global Information Society. Uh, but we also want to raise the, uh, the issue that uh, we have to think about the ones who will not be covered even in 20 years from now. And uh, we want to uh, raise this uh, offline internet solution, which can be a great way to fill gaps and deliver uh, uh, effective impact in all these kinds of uh, situations. So we also want to encourage all organizations working in the field of information access and content uh, creation to join this offline internet consortium and uh, help us uh, achieve this great goal. Thank you. So thank you, Edouard. And that is, again, it's always so fantastic. Every time I hear from Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, there are some amazing examples of what you're doing, of what you're actually managing to achieve. And I think that is a really important point that clearly the goal in the long run is to get everyone online, but that's the long run. And there are people who, there are so many people who they can't wait that long. They should already have been able to access materials and you're really making this a reality. So thank you for that. And 
of course, similarly, it's not as if, as, as I said earlier, it's not as if any internet connection is 100% sure. We've seen in the States plenty recently with, uh, with the various natural disasters that connections can fall down. You can be cut off even in, even in the country where the internet sort of really started off so well. Um, so now I'm very happy to hand over to Ramuna Petrucevaite uh, Petru uh, Petru um, from IFL Electronic Information for Libraries. Um, again, a fantastic partner organization that again is really focused on delivering real change on showing how connectivity can really make a difference when you do it through libraries. So Ramuna, over to you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you everyone because I really feel energized and, and in the right place. Uh, I think together we really can change, um, you know, to better this world. Um, so my name is Ramuna Petuchovait and everyone has problems with pronunciation of my name. I'm, I'm based in Lithuania and it's probably I should change my second name to shorter one. Uh, but you can use also the the first, which is fine. Uh, so IFAL stands for Electronic Information for Libraries, and, and we are international organization um, established since 1999. Um, and we are dedicated to enabling access to knowledge through libraries in more than 40 developing and transition economy countries in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Latin America. I full partners with libraries and library consortia as we believe that they are most, uh, this is the most sustainable way to improve access to knowledge and, and enable people. I full currently works with over 3,000 uh, 3, libraries across countries. So uh, our vision is really to see a world in which every person has the knowledge they need to achieve their full potential. And today, the internet and connectivity and digital skills makes uh, a difference whether people can access knowledge or not. Uh, and, um, and that's why we really work with libraries um, to, as I said, to empower people. I feel work is organized around four key programs and, and we are focusing on the following areas, affordable access to e-resources, open access to research and, and science data, fair copyright laws and community development. Um, and, and why I feel public library innovation program that I represent, we, we are here, is because we believe that public libraries trusted, uh, trusted institutions. They are staffed with skilled information professionals and they are uniquely placed to connect communities by providing public access to computers and internet and training people to use it. However, we see that in developing and transition economy countries where the need is the greatest, public libraries are under-resourced. And, and therefore, we advocate with national governments and, inter and also internationally for equipping public libraries with computers and internet connections for free public use. We empower public librarians to use public access computers and internet connectivity creatively to provide digital literacy training and other services in communities that address most critical needs. And also we, uh, the libraries through those services contribute to achieving local and, um, and global development uh, goals. And here are two examples what we are be, we're be, we're doing. So in 2020, we completed two year plus training of trainers program in partnership with Kenya National Library, Namibia Library and Archive Service, National Library in, in Uganda and Library and Information Association of Zambia. 
trainers of all four countries attended the workshops that covered 11 subjects, such as general facilitation skills, leadership skills, reimagining library spaces, design thinking for new services, project management, learning circles for online courses, advanced computer literacy, and so and so on. In so these trainers, 62 trainers, um, uh, have already trained over six, 670 public librarians. Ultimately, their efforts result in better services and improved practice in public library based, based on better use of public access computers and infrastructure. And this means farmers have access to farming information, weather information, uh, young women, and also um, and also children and can, can have access to new educational resources, reading, digital reading resources. Uh, also, uh, people in communities can have information about uh, local health issues and so on and so on. Another example is comes from Ghana, where we we worked with we supported a project uh, where four regional public libraries in Ashanti, Upper East, Walter, and Western regions um, used mobile ones equipped equipped with solar power laptops, computers, and mod modem internet and other equipment for teaching. And they travel to junior high schools that do not have connectivity and are not going to get um, this. And even in some cases, they would not have access to, to electricity. Um, so those libraries provided uh, mobile ICT skills uh, cl classes for, for children that obligatory need to take exam in ICT for passing uh, basic edu education certificate exams. So what we've seen, um, so from 2016 to 2019, the mobile libraries helped over 3,200 students to pass this ICT subject that they many were failing before and, and were able to move to to a secondary school or vocationally vocationally school um, and and then become uh, you know uh, pursue their professional prof professional careers uh, further um, so in 2019 we assessed and we we saw 84 percent of children who gained those practical ICT computer skills through the project, pass, passing the, the exam while in 2015, where, when we were starting project, was 45%. So, so this is a huge difference. And, and that's why we uh, pledged to, we will continue advocating for resourcing of public libraries in developing and transition economy countries, including those serving the most vulnerable and hard to reach communities in urban and rural settings. We also, uh, through extensive train of trainers program, we will build public librarians' ability to design digital skills training curricula to meet local needs and to provide computer, uh, internet and information literacy skills training in their communities. And we also will continue to develop and promote examples of creative use of technology by public libraries to address the digital divide so that libraries are empowered and no one in their communities is left behind the opp opportunities that digital technology provides. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramun, and thank you so much for giving that insight on all the really great work that IFL carries out. I, I know that from my work with IFLA, we draw so heavily on the examples from the Public Library Innovation Programme of exa as examples of 
as said at the beginning, what happens when you can bring libraries and connectivity together in order to actually change people's lives. So thank you. I'm now very happy to, and thank you also for the correction on the pronunciation. So now I know it's Petrukovaitis. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Carlos Ray Moreno from the Association from Progressive, for Progressive Communications, which of course is sort of legendary in this space for promoting laws, promoting practices that give people effective, meaningful, equitable access to information. So Carlos, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you everyone for, for hosting this this event today. Very happy to be here representing APC. And for us, I mean, public access to the in, to internet services are a key element in addressing needs for more equitable access in both developing and, and developed countries. Uh, not everyone has personal access to the necessary bandwidth and equipment to make full use of the internet. Us at the Association for Progressive Communication have been encouraging support for provision of public access facilities since, since our foundation 30 years ago. And since then it has become increasingly apparent that personal broadband subscriptions are not able to meet all the requirements for internet access. Uh, recently, APC has been working in partnership with IFLA to promote awareness of the need for national policies which uh, support the, the provision of public, uh, public access facilities, in particular in the United, in United Nations policy discussions, uh, so that the importance of public access via the centers and libraries is recognized as a central tool for digital inclusion. Uh, this collaboration and the defense of public access was highlighted at the ITU, at the UN Commission for Science and Technology for Development uh, consultations, as well as during the World Summit on the Information Society uh, that was continued with the WSIS plus 10 review. There and going forward, APC participated thanks to our ECOSOC status that uh, we offer to everyone to to bring your pledge to, to those uh, close spaces that sometimes a civil society cannot access to, to bring their voices. But most uh, recently, APC has continued its, its promotion of uh, public access by supporting the creation of an enabling environment for community networks, most notably with the Internet Society, as we see that uh, these community networks are at the center for digital inclusion in, in rural and remote areas. And also because they frequently provide uh, public computer access facilities as they do public access via Wi-Fi in, in, in public spaces. Uh, these efforts are central to our strategic plan 2020 to 2023. And in this regard, APC welcomes this declaration uh, because it aligns very much with our past, present and, and future policy advocacy plans. Uh, in particular, uh, and in terms of the pledge, uh, going forward, APC commits to continue supporting discussions on, on public access at global and regional level uh, through our membership in the ITU and, and our UN ECOSOC uh, status, while engaging with national governments in public policy consultations uh, processes related to digital inclusion and, and public access. Uh, we also commit to continue our support to APC members that are present in more than 50 countries around the world, as well as our community networks partners to create more public facilities. And while doing that, also facilitating the sharing of experiences among them and across this partnership for public access that, uh, that is, is, is been doing that. But also maybe personally, strengthening the links between all of you between the traditional public access providers, the librarians, the libraries, and so forth, with more innovative solutions like uh, community networks. So connectivity can be extended to cover a wider area uh, in the community, right? Just listening to Ramune just now, I see a lot of uh, synergies in between different programs that we are running in those countries that she mentioned with the activities that she was talking about. So looking forward to strengthen those links and, and, and to work more uh, to take this declaration and its goals further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, and, and especially for pointing out, for underlining the potential for working through community networks and, uh, and other tools and also bring people, more people online. I think certainly from Ramuna's presentation, from our own experience, there's a growing awareness in libraries, for example, that there's so much that can be done by working in partnership with others 
that libraries don't need to do everything themselves, but they can, they have something really unique to offer, but it, this only really makes sense when you're working with others. So it's great to have a partner like the APC and the APC's members. So finally, in the list of speakers, I'd like to ha hand over to Don Means, who would normally be comparing this session as a whole. Um, I think uh, as is sort of traditional when doing anything around technology or the internet, someone has internet problems in order to help us all understand why connectivity is so important in the first place. Um, I'm hoping it works for you now. Don, are you able to connect? I think so. Can you hear me? See me? Yep, you're clear and we can see you. Go for it. Hey, uh, thank you, Stephen. Could you bring up the, uh, the uh, original slides, the, the startup slides? I just wanted to use them as a reference point. Uh, that I can give me a second. Sure, and and That's thank you for stepping in uh, to handle the facilitation job. Great, great work there. Uh, go back up, 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 up a couple more. Yeah, down. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you okay, there. That's, we'll start there. Uh, yes, the, uh, there's the. I'm having some difficult, some technical difficulties today, but I think it makes the point that uh, uh, that we have backups. It's just a general strategy, and it also is part of the public access story. Is that everyone should be in a place where they have proximity to a public access station, if you will. Uh, a library, uh, uh, a telecenter, a community center, whatever, uh, that simply having people uh, in this environment not able to access public information, public services has just become unacceptable. Uh, you heard some just really amazing uh, presentations, however brief they were, just because of our time element today, uh, from the, uh, this great group of people and the organizations that they represent. Uh, this, is, this is a remarkable uh, partnership that, that obviously has is, is been in business, at least the organizations have been in business for a long time trying to address this. Uh, this is not a new goal to connect everybody. Uh, it's at least 15 years old and that, that it formalizes as a, as a goal, but it's not happening. It has not been happening. And it's basically that the, the, the current technologies and business models have failed to reach the other half of the, of the world uh, with the services. Uh, businesses are set up to optimize for profitability and, and that profitability goes down as you start to reach people that are, that are farther away and have less uh, disposable income. And it goes up as you upsell to people that are uh, not price sensitive and, and uh, will pay for anything it just costs less and 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 so that's been the bind of relying on the market to solve this public access is a uh, a strategy that basically we're saying that that without a public access component there is no credible strategy for reaching everybody. It, it would have already happened if it, if it were. Uh, there are these three components that uh, represent the, uh, the Partnership for Public Access. The centers, uh, these hubs, which libraries represent uh, as a physical place and uh, uh, that, that should be within reach of everybody. Community networks, in our view, are the natural extension of that. So the policy issues that, that need to support this, to enable this, are universal service funds. Uh, that is to say, a portion of the uh, revenues from telecommunications services into a common pool to support universal access. Uh, these funds are, they're all over the place in terms of how well they're implemented, but uh, you can't make an argument that there's a higher priority than providing basic access, a basic level of access to everyone. And uh, also another policy area for advocacy is in the area of spectrum. We've talked about spectrum on these sessions a lot, uh, more open spectrum for more people to use for 
DIY, do-it-yourself types of infrastructures. Community networks are the leading example of how communities, which are underserved and neglected by the market forces, can take matters into their own hands and build networks for themselves. Our point is that the central regulator, uh, the, the, the central government in, in each country, which has that kind of responsibility, should at the very least extend a access, a high performance access point uh, hub in, in every community and let those local communities uh, build out off of that. So libraries represent that as a node or even a hub on the network. The offline internet is really fascinating and the work that uh, BSF has done and others uh, to bring digital services to people anywhere. It's not necessary that you have internet you know, to access all the information that you need. There are certainly subsets. We all use a subset of the internet anyway. And so by designing these local autonomous networks that can operate in any circumstance, uh, people have an opportunity to access educational information services. And, and that closes the loop on this three-part strategy that can accommodate almost anyone, almost anywhere. And that's an important uh, point if we're gonna actually uh, reach people. So we're, we're advocating for uh, two approaches. One is advocacy, uh, that, that libraries should uh, call for action from their own national regulators, their state or provincial governments, and even their local, uh, uh, local environments to support uh, the delivery of these essential services and they're even more essential now in the in the context of the pandemic and then also not just to call for other people to take action we think that libraries should be exemplars and demonstrators of of these kinds of uh of services and and, and make that known so that two part of both calling for action at the policy level and and also uh demonstrating uh, the value at, at each level um we have, uh, we have, as you know, been advocating and working for extending library access beyond the library itself, using wireless technology to set up these uh, neighborhood uh, access stations, as we're calling them. The idea is that everyone, we think everyone should be within easy reach of such a, such a facility, such a capability, even if they can't have it all at home. The, 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 the gain, that is to say, the, the cost of delivery of, a, of a, a community station is a tiny, tiny fraction of what it costs to reach every home. Uh, and that serves both as a, a preliminary entry point and also as a backup. So uh, that adds resilience to the, the network in any area if you have a reliable point that has it prepared for any kind of outages. And we think that's that's that dual use of access and backup is is a, a critical role that, that libraries play. Uh, the last point I want to make is that it's not just connecting everyone; it's enabling people. We can't just rely on Elon to blanket the planet with a connection and and expect everybody to take advantage of it. Nor can we expect. Uh, you know, Facebook phones to accomplish that. People need to understand the, the opportunities and the risks involved in interacting through these open networks. It is not risk-free and increasingly we're seeing more and more uh, dangers uh, and, and problems as the internet grows and as the sophistication of, uh, they'll say the bad actors uh, continues to grow. So libraries are there as this trusted entity, this most flexible and, and, and comprehensive uh, institution that does more for more people than any other institution at all, plus represents a global profession and a global network of facilities, you know, some 400 something thousand public libraries around the world. Uh, which we, as the partnership, are trying to mobilize and activate to pursue this, this strategy in common. So uh, connecting and enabling are both necessary components of actually having uh, people make productive use of this, this marvel uh, that we call the Internet. 
So thank you everybody for tuning in and thank you all uh, my fellow partners in this, in this partnership for your presentations and your great stuff. So, and thank you again, Stephen, for uh, uh, leading us through this today. Thank you, Don. So, um, and I'll put on my own video. So, th 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 thank you, Don, and also thank you for summarising so well the sort of the overall logic, the overall thrust behind what we're trying to do with the partnership for public access. And um, I've included the link to um, the the I've included the link to the, the the call for action in the chat, and I'll put it up there again. Um, just so that people can read it. I'm also going to put it up quickly on the screen. Um, I've created a slide for that in the meanwhile, just so that people can actually see it directly. There we go. It's not the most beautiful slide, I apologize for this, but therefore you just have this up on the screen so that everyone can actually see it. Um, we've got another nine minutes until the, the, the webinar is normally closed. And I thought what could be interesting at this point is actually the audience, the, all of you who've, who've come along today in order to take part, I recognize so many of the names. You've been following this series for eight months or so now. Don, I think you can correct on how long it is. This, is. this has been a longer series than I guess we probably hoped for. Um, it's weird to say that, that this shouldn't have been a 26 part series, but, but events have conspired to mean that we do need to keep on doing this, keep on having this conversation. And um, I'd be really interested actually to hear from other panelists, of course, but also the participants on your reflections on this, your suggestions, both on thoughts about, I don't know, how to move this forwards, who that we who we can talk to, but also any reactions you have, and this is a more negative question I'm aware on, why we aren't there now and how we can make it different this time. So. I'm very happy to open to the floor in case there are others who'd like to to say anything. I'll add one point, Stephen, um, and it's it's just the point about you know the market and and what the market should be doing, what public sector should be doing, and how they fit together. Uh, just want to give one example: libraries have a history of driving demand for commercial products and services, from books themselves 100 years ago to first generation broadband, when a lot of people had heard about it but didn't know what anybody was talking about, they didn't understand the technology or the terms, but they went to a library and they experienced you know, streaming media. I'm talking about the, you know, the 90s now, from you know, somewhere across the country, and they go, wow, that is great. Whatever that is, I want that at home. And so the libraries is as demonstration sites and showcases for all kinds of emerging uh, products and services, which may be beyond the, you know, the reach of, of everybody or the understanding of everybody helps drive the demand for the adoption. And it's just not understood by commercial interest that libraries play that role. Uh, and, and it should be. And I think it's part of the message we're trying to get out. These are compatible uh, 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 approaches. I think that that's certainly the case. There's a, a fascinating piece of economics to be done about libraries, not, not I don't know, not so much loss leader, but the free sample that helps people, that acts as a stepping stone, that helps people actually understand the value that can be brought by the internet, <coughs> and then choose to invest themselves in it. And I think certainly we've seen so many people in the states elsewhere getting their first taste of the internet through libraries and then graduating to become a home user. Of course, as we find, that doesn't mean that once people have a connection at home, the library is, is no longer useful. There are any number of reasons linked to the amount of data you have, the speed of your home connection, the circumstances under which you're accessing at home, your access to devices, the reliability of the home connection, skills, comfort, social usage that can still mean that public access solutions can very happily complement private access solutions. But are there any other suggestions or questions? I'd be fascinated to hear from others what they think are the elements that have held us back so far and how we can make sure that it's different this time. Hi, uh, this is Stephen Abram in Canada. Um, I, I love the work that IFLA is doing. <laughs> um, now, 
I'm going to add a few comments because I realize that the uh, the statement that's up on the screen is ne necessarily short, but I think we need to uh, look at it through a couple of different lenses. One is the lens of political will, and one is the lens of social rightness. And I think as librarians, we use the lens of social rightness and expect people to understand what we're talking about. And we need to look at the lens of political will. So what the statement could be improved by is the use of adjectives. Uh, we're using nouns instead of verbs and verbs move to action, whereas nouns just sit there. So we know what we mean by broadband, but we don't know how to describe it so that politicians understand it. So you put a word in front of it like equitable broadband, then you start to generate the conversation which we need, which equity is about cost. That's the strategy. Equity is about uh, distribution and diffusion. We, we also need to replace certain things in the political mindset. They're all being uh, uh, staring at the bright, shiny object, which is G5, 5G. And what they don't know, and which always surprises them when I'm talking to them, is that hardwired gigabit broadband is 10,000 times faster than G, 5G. So if we don't start putting that data point into their heads, we are not talking equity. Yes, 5G, G, 5G works great for all your daily needs, but it doesn't work great for handling big data, employment, uh, supporting streaming media, that sort of stuff. And then I'll, I, I got a bunch of other points, but I just want to add one around uh, learning and access to learning and how that levels the playing field for emerging economies. We tend to call it education, which is a noun, whereas learning is the better word. And how do we rise up certain sectors, especially rural, remote, BIPOC communities where poverty is the, is the limiter in some communities, and it's especially true in the emerging and third world. But within this statement, it needs a, a, a post piece or an epilogue that gives people reasons to engage. And what's the social and economic return on investment? And also why does this need to be a government investment and not a private sector investment. There is no business model to support this. And we need to be clear on that, that the large broadband telecom providers have no interest unless they're given the money. They might bid on something, but not-for-profit utilities and the ability to explore new ways of doing things, the Elon Musk project, mm -hmm. The, uh, the Google balloons, all that sort of stuff. That, that's not what's going to fix rural America or rural Ontario or Northern Ontario, but it can be a good starting step in parts of Africa and parts of uh, mountainous regions and stuff like that. I'll stop talking, but I just think there's an opportunity here to add some adjectives and some verbs to this statement that serve as the anchors for a discussion instead of as a statement of uh, positive social values. Thank, thank you, Stephen. I, I really appreciate this and, and we're very grateful that you've already spoken at one of the previous uh, sessions in this. And I know that I already use your intervention there as a reference for myself when trying to think about how to do advocacy effectively. I think all those points are very well taken into account. I think that connectivity, connecting things with real outcomes and really setting out actions that people can undertake is, 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 is so important. I think one thing that we need to do as we take this statement forward, this call to action, is to think hard about 
how can we communicate it? How can we make it make sense to people, to politicians? So I've taken note of all those, and of course we're recording the session, and so we'll definitely look to include those as we go along. Um, we're coming up to, we've come up to the hour. I just want to check, are there any other interventions? Otherwise we can always sort of pause recording and then carry on in a more informal setup. So I should check, I'll just give, five seconds for someone else to speak if they'd like to speak. Otherwise, then I'll close the recording and we can continue informally as we've tended to do in previous weeks. Um, aloha. Um, this is Sean McLaughlin. I just wanted to chime in. I made a note in the chat that um, as a person who's worked in the media access realm for my lifespan, so much of the conversation is maps perfectly onto the same efforts of helping people get a voice on through media, getting access to media, both to receive and to share information over media channels. So I just wanted to share that thought. I think that there's a, a lot of rich um, support um, from those from that movement as well that could be brought in that some libraries have made those connections already, but um, certainly the internet efforts make that a simpler, clearer connection to make. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So I think with that, I'm going to, we're going to come to the end of the actual formal recording, simply just to say thank you so much to everyone who's who's uh, contributed here. So to all of our speakers, to Jane, to Maylin, to Teddy, to Ramona, to uh, Eduard, to Carlos, and of course to Don himself. Um, Please keep, please follow what, uh, please keep on follow what we're doing, following what we're doing. I hope that you're all on Don's mailing list for these sessions. I should note that we're obviously going to be involved in the Internet Governance Forum, which is taking place next week and in two weeks. In particular, the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access and Libraries will be holding a session on the 5th of uh, November at 12.40 p.m. Universal Time, General Greenwich Mean Time. So do have a look at the Internet Governance Forum program in order to take part. And that will include, of course, reference to what we're talking about today, but in particular, some of the lessons that we've been learning from the COVID uh, crisis about how can we make sure that libraries are best able to provide support. So in the meanwhile, I just want to say thank you to everyone for your time. Thank you for your contributions. It's always great to, to it's always great to draw on your, your insights. And I'm going to close the recording now, but then, as in previous weeks, we will continue talking informally. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh,